Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with David DeWitt on governance gaps. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario to discuss some issue of uh, global governance or international public policy. Today I'm very happy to welcome the uh, Vice President of Programs here at the Center for International Governance Innovation, Dr. David DeWitt. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. Usually I have a guest and we talk about an issue and the, the governance surrounding it or the lack of governance surrounding right. it. And today we'll start at any rate flipping that around. We'll talk about governance and in particular the issues that are in dire need of it. Uh, Center for International Governance Innovation has a mandate to promote uh, public policy, thinking about uh, global governance issues, right. and uh, you're now in charge of the program operation, the program side of the operation. Right. So uh, just could you step back a little bit and reflect uh, for us on your understanding of CG's particular mandate and, and its niche, because there are many uh, think tanks that are involved in explore, exploring uh, global governance issues. Um, CG's one and not necessarily one of the bigger ones. How do you see CG contributing in a, in a creative way to thinking about global governance gaps? Good questions all, and there are a number of them in there. Um, so let me start with, I think, um, what the, the vision of CG as a think tank uh, is. Um, it, the shortest way of phrasing it, I think, is that uh, the initial intent is to create a Canadian-based uh, think tank that uh, is prepared to address some very tough uh, global uh, issues, issues that are sufficiently um, important, uh, potentially very serious, um, longer term. Uh, they're, they're, they involve over-the-horizon kinds of thinking, but also obviously require uh, a much more regular uh, s set of, of uh, interventions, if you want to use that language, or actions, um, in areas that uh, no single state or no single actor in the international community has a capacity of addressing on, on its own. That um, embedded within the mandate is the, the assumption, and it, it may well true, tr uh, prove, in some cases, not necessarily always to be, be uh, held, that um, most of these issues require some sense of collaboration and cooperation across boundaries, uh, across thematic areas, that they're complex. Um, and uh, CG is, uh, albeit a small organization, uh, through careful selection of areas in which to concentrate, meant to contribute to that debate. Um, I think it's important to understand that as a think tank, CG sees itself as a place that not only carries on um, research, but is a place that also facilitates bringing together the best and the, the brightest from wherever they, they may be to bring their views to bear. Um, and uh, the results are not um, necessarily all that straightforward, that uh, for a think tank, we would have our standard deliverables. You'd look at uh, the published word, whether that's in a, uh, in today's world, it might be a blog uh, or an online commentary. Um, it might be the classic uh, uh, journal article or op-ed piece in a major newspaper or indeed a book. Um, but there are also other sides to that. Um, because there's a commitment to bring uh, evidence and analysis to the public domain and particularly to public policy, we have to target uh, uh, our audiences in some way. So while there's, uh, as you're doing here, an interest to try and unpack uh, important issues um, that anyone can have access to, there's also the more selective targeting so that uh, for the work that focuses on uh, the G20, um, our concern would be to ensure that we have access to some of the leaders of the G20 uh, those may be uh, leaders of, of governments and maybe their senior officials uh, so that uh, we can bring our views and the evidence uh, or evidence-based analysis uh, to them and try and get them to at least uh, consider the context, consider the, the, the issues. Um, so as a think tank and global g governance, it's big issues, complex issues, requiring collaboration, cooperation, and because of how we position ourselves, 
being both part of the research community, but also engaging the world of public policy and decision making. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of things you mentioned there I find particularly interesting, and one is the conception of CG as a Canadian-based think tank. Not as a Canadian think tank, right. I mean, the understanding is not that there's a Canadian perspective on all of these issues, but the, it's based in Canada, but reaching out globally. Right. What's your understanding of the, the benefit and the disadvantage of being a Canadian-based think tank? Well, I think um, you, you, it's interesting that you, you put it that way because uh, it does c cut across and it, it's got uh, mul multiple sides, not, not just two, I think. Um, first of all, as a Canadian-based think tank, one of the things we're differentiating ourselves by, from by saying that is that um, uh, while we would expect that the vast majority of the items on our agenda would be of interest to the Canadian uh, government or provincial governments as well and other actors within Canadian society, we're not, going to be, we're not a Canadian foreign policy institute. We're not going to be driven by a specific Canadian agenda. But I, our expectation would be that the things that we do address would be of concern to Canadians uh, from governments all the way through to individuals because of their significance. Uh, being Canadian based I think does carry a, a, a kind of, uh, I was going to say aura, uh, perhaps that's not quite the right term. Um, it, it provides a context. There is um, still in this world, I believe, a sense that uh, Canada has a unique and privileged role to play in the international community if it wishes to. Um, I'm not referring to the old age of Canadian, uh, the golden age of Canadian diplomacy or peacekeeping or one or two specific things that, that we can identify. It's more a sense that over the last 50 or 60 years, there is an acknowledgement by many of the players in the international community, especially in the intergovernmental communities, both go governments and international agencies. Um, that Canada is one of those uh, unique places where liberal democracy has emerged, uh, multiculturalism fl flourishes, uh, we played a responsible role in many different parts of the international community from p peace and war issues through uh, technology transfer to economic development and, so, and, uh, and uh, social policy development. Um, that we are privileged in the sense of being part of the OECD, um, that we have an extraordinarily uh, welcoming environment and supportive environment, that we have a particular kind of Canadian capacity. Um, and I think there also is an, a presumption that um, the way Canada has positioned itself with having very privileged access to some of the key countries in the international community, the United States, the UK, France, the European, uh, uh, states, now increasingly also East Asia and South Asia, parts of Africa and the Middle East, um, that we have access that um, gives us an opportunity and that much of that access doesn't come with the, the baggage of an imperial power mm -hmm. uh, or even a post-colonial power. Um, that when we had to make decisions around the use of our, our military, we've not been uh, We've not used our military in a unilateral way. We do it through a, a collective, a cooperative uh, a st structure. I think that brings a particular kind of set of expectations and, uh, uh, to a Canadian institution um, that is appropriate when we're dealing with issues of governance. Right. Uh, because we're dealing with, with issues that presumes the necessity of knowing how to collaborate, knowing how to cooperate, knowing how to move the agenda forward. In addition to that, Canada really is a microcosm of the world, isn't it? In many ways. Yeah. Very good. We'll be back again with uh, David DeWitt to talk further about governance gaps. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, David, I'm intrigued by this idea of trying to deal with events coming down the road more than just a day or two away, what we called over the horizon right. uh, issues. And in my field, which is your field also, um, we both know that usually governance is an attempt to solve the last problem. And so the United Nations is established to solve the outbreak of World War I, and the United Nations is established to solve the outbreak of World War II. And so, in a sense, we're always doing, or often doing governance behind the curve uh, for yesterday's problem. How do you actually identify 
the future problem, the problem that hasn't yet reared its ugly head, that you're going to have to anticipate a governance need for? Yeah, I mean, that's always a, a tough, tough question because you're, you're taking on some risk because you could be wrong. Right. Um, so it's not entirely, obviously, without um, some closer ob observation. Um, but there are a number of aspects to this. One is that our job is not to compete with those who are given the responsibility of making decisions about the implementation of policy or those of us who are put in the position, responsible positions of designing policy itself. Um, they're, they're closer to the, the, the coal face, they're closer to the day-to-day -day operations. But we can learn a lot from them by um, consulting with them and trying to assess what they anticipate, what are they worried about because of, of um, losing control over uh, the results of decisions that are made by them, by their colleagues, in alliances, in collective agreements, whatever it may, may be. Um, but I think this is where one of the important lessons from um, the academic world or the broader world of research, academic and, uh, and otherwise. Uh, people who are prepared to think about big issues, uh, who are informed by history but not captured by it, um, who start seeing trends and are prepared to kind of think about what are, uh, what are the possible directions those trends could lead us to and think about options. Uh, so that you can start get, getting a sense of what if this condition changes? What if that assumption turns out not to be true? Where might it go? Um, I expect that uh, folks 20 years ago who tried to get attention around c climate change um, had some pretty good scientific evidence about why they were concerned about uh, climate change right. and had some pretty good um, empirical evidence, scientific or otherwise, about the fact that governments and the private sector didn't seem to be addressing this problem. Uh, and that they could then start modeling, whether it was formally or just through ideas and conversation, where in fact the options might be foreclosed or opened up, depending on whether or not intervention was going to occur, depending on what was going to be a worst case scenario or best case scenario. So I, I think that a lot of it is just bringing thoughtful people together around issues that are already um, in the public domain and are not being resolved, or issues that um, are starting to be identified as troubling and, and worrisome, um, and people start using their imagination, their informed imagination. I mean, this is not entirely s speculation, I think. Um, that's why it is important to consult. It is important to be able to reach out to experts in the various fields. Um, but I'd argue that it also requires us to be able to break through silos so that if you're an economist, you're prepared to talk to folks who aren't economists. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a climatologist, you're prepared to speak to pe people in the, the policy world and, and the world of development because that's where you're going to get new ideas and you're going to start seeing, it seems to me, the, um, the possible profound nature of the issues that we have to start addressing. Right, and now you're signaling in one of the other classic problems with doing governance or designing governance, and that is tending to identify problems as discrete and not seeing that they're connected to other problems right. and they have feedbacks and so forth. Yeah. So a big part of CG's value added is genuine interdisciplinarity, not only in the inputs to thinking about governance challenges, but also in thinking about how to design better governance that actually recognizes that there aren't silos, that climate change is related to. Yeah. If, if we're doing our job right, that's exactly what we should be doing. And we shouldn't be the only ones doing it, obviously. We should be, and, and we're fortunate because we have uh, a relationship, as you know, with two good u universities right next door, door to us, uh, University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier. And, and they bring enormous strengths. And one of our opportunities, uh, and by our I mean not just CG, but the three institutions to, together, is to harness that cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary capacity in ways that aren't normally uh, harnessed. Because most universities, like most large organizations, are fairly rigid. And the rewards and the incentives are defined by the units. Mm -hmm. If we can break through that, if we can use CG as a vehicle to give people opportunities to talk to colleagues whom they no, don't normally talk with, to provide opportunities for graduate students and undergraduates to move across those traditional barriers because they want to seek answers to complex problems. 
where the answer is, resides in bringing multiple disciplines together, multiple tools of analysis, uh, competing, possibly competing or conflicting theoretical uh, positions. That's where we're going to have, have that's where we're going to have breakthroughs. Yeah. Um, the challenge, I guess, for a, a think tank, um, the way I'm presenting it to you, is that on the one hand, there's the need to be seen to having an impact, but on the other hand, if we're doing our job right, we're actually taking on big challenges where impacts aren't going to be seen for a very long time. Right. And that if we're really doing our job well, we are affecting change in the context in which these problems are going to be analyzed and understood, and therefore it might not even be recognized as something that, let's say, CG facilitator promoted, because it's become part of the norm. Mm -hmm. It's been, become part of the context, which is uh, not being overly dramatic or not meaning to be overly dramatic. I think some people would suggest that, for instance, CG's contribution th through to the early uh, L20 idea that morphed into transform itself to the G20 is a contribution of that kind. One of the under the radar contributions yeah. to an over the radar problem back in the day. Right. Now you did say that that's a risky thing and I agree completely right. that uh, there are risks involved with doing distant planning, and distant yeah. thinking. But uh, risk involves also the willingness to be wrong. Occasionally. Absolutely. Yeah. So think tanks typically don't like to be wrong. They tend to sort of market themselves as being right all the time, expert on all the right. issues. How does one embrace this risk, which includes the willingness to be wrong some of the time and maintain yeah. one's sort of position? Uh, not easily. <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with making sure you have the right colleagues in place. Um, if you're a think tank and you have a, a board, you, you want to make sure that your board um, appreciates that risk management is an aspect of it and a think tank from my personal perspective, should not be risk averse, but just should be a smart risk manager. Um, that I think all of us who've had any time at all in the academic world know that um, while there's a, a huge incentive of always being right, the really cr creative ones are ones who take those risks and learn from um, results that weren't anticipated. Mm -hmm. right. And that may not be wrong, it may be simply not anticipated. So, I think it's almost changing the, the, the language, the discourse. I'd rather not worry about a think tank being right or wrong, but rather... Um, um, being willing to learn. Being w willing to, uh, to learn and an outcome that is not what you expected after you've done the work is not necessarily a wrong outcome. It simply informs you in new and important ways that otherwise you wouldn't be informed about. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we'll be back again with David DeWitt in just a moment. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, David, what are CG's concrete research programs, and uh, what kinds of particular governance gaps do you anticipate CG attempting to address within the context of those? In a formal sense, we have um, identified through a brief strategic plan uh, that CG should be addressing um, four areas. Global economy, global security, international development, and energy and environment, and things related to that, including cl climate change. Um, and I expect that um, these are you know, laying out um, some areas that help guide our decisions about where we allocate our resources. And I don't mean just money, I'm talking about time and bringing together colleagues and so forth. Um, in, in, the, in the next short while, we're going to be focused on building up our capacity in the global economy and global security. I think um, the other two areas are going to emerge um, over the next few years. And uh, they will be part of the global economy and global security uh, anyhow, because as you see these four areas, they are all intertwined mm -hmm. depending on the, the, uh, the questions you ask. Um, certainly, um, in some ways, our focus on the global economy is unfortunately or otherwise timely or op opportune. Uh, we do have some um, superb uh, uh, capacity on, uh, in that area and in the areas of um, global financial r regulatory challenges. Um, 2008 and now the recent um, crisis that we're currently 
working our way through. Um, both um, have um, created opportunities um, for, for CG because of the expertise we, we have here. Um, so I think that that will uh, remain as a, um, a cornerstone of CG's work for the next th three to five years. Um, Does being a Canadian-based think tank help on that particular file, since Canada is generally considered globally as having weathered this particular economic crisis? My sense well is, so certainly my, my colleagues here who, have, um, who are expert in this area and have uh, a network of connections uh, at the most senior levels in both governments and uh, intergovernmental agencies uh, in this area, I think at least partially, um, have opportunities of making, uh, of, of having influence, um, of making a significant contribution because they are um, connected with Canada and Canadian institution and um, because their professional lives began with, um, within the, the Canadian um, financial and economic mm -hmm. worlds. I think that's uh, uh, opened up and CG is pursuing this in partnership with a, a number of other players as well. Yeah, in this, this particular file, um, we, we are partners with um, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, INET, that was founded by George Soros. So we're a, a principal partner with um, that effort. Uh, we have a number of projects that are evolving right now um, with our, our colleagues uh, that come from uh, the G20 countries. Um, and it has fit well with our focus on G20 and trying to address the challenges of, of governance through the G20 model. Mm -hmm. um, gl global security, I think, um, is, the s is reasonably the second area that we're going to be uh, f focusing on. Um, we've had some success in an ongoing project uh, at CG on security sector reform, which is a niche area, but it's an, it's an important niche area that straddles uh, development and security, fragile states, uh, preventive di diplomacy, so you don't see states shifting into, from fragile into failed states. Um, it affects questions around development. Um, and so I think that's an area that uh, I, I anticipate uh, continuing in. We've had some success around um, issues dealing with nuclear nonproliferation. Um, most re recently, a major s study by uh, one of our, our colleagues on the IAEA, and that'll be coming out in the next two months or so, uh, which is a, a substantial critical examination of the role of that principal organization that has authority over um, um, nuclear energy uh, issues and nuclear technology worldwide. and. Uh, we know has simply not been up to the uh, ch challenges that the uh, evolving nu nuclear world has faced. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, what we're going to see is over the next few years, um, a number of new projects that are going to focus on areas from, uh, that will embrace regional conflict m management. Um, I think that uh, though we talk about global uh, governance, what we're really talking about is governance in which these are big issues that in one way or another uh, are, are or should be of concern to the global community, but many of these need to be addressed on sub-global le uh, levels. That could be a regional level, it could be a sub-regional. Um, and if you look systematically in almost any place that there has been protracted conflict, there have been formal institutions, but they have not been adequate to the challenges. Right. And uh, so I think there's an enormous room to uh, provide some creative uh, opportunities mm -hmm. there. Yeah, quite so. Well, we'll be back once again with David DeWitt to talk about governance gaps and you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. So perhaps we can be a little autobiographical here in this last segment. You have a distinguished career as an academic, a scholar of international relations, and a lot of work not only on Canadian foreign policy, but on Middle Eastern politics and on uh, the East Asian region. Mm. How has your work in your prior life affected your understanding of your work 
in your current role as VP programs here at CG, and, and how do you think it'll work the other way around? Uh, how will your exposure to the think tank business likely affect your own research when you have a chance to get back to it? I don't think I could be here without having gone through a lot of the experiences that I went through uh, as an academic. And I must admit that I feel enormously lucky, privileged to have had those years because um, I, made a, I, I made what uh, perhaps a few years after the fact I realized was a rather conscious uh, a decision. Most of my colleagues who are truly successful scholars um, often wisely choose to focus on one or two things and build that up incrementally with very focused individual work and it, um, it supports their inclination, their interests, and their style. I think I realized very early on that we all have strengths and that I was not all that happy being a solitary scholar. Um, that um, I found a lot of, of challenge and pleasure in trying to bring colleagues together and identify areas which I thought uh, deserved and could hopefully uh, benefit from serious scholarly attention. And that part of my interest was also um, formally acknowledging that I wanted to do scholarship that in some way I could then say, and if I were in a position of authority, how would this scholarship affect the challenges I had at making policy or implementing mm -hmm. policy? Um, how do I know things now that I wouldn't have otherwise? And what difference does it make in the real world? Mm -hmm. um, and I am, was fortunate to be in an environment that allowed me to do that. And a lot of academic uh, locations wouldn't reward that, or wouldn't support that. There are costs. So for anyone who is thinking of moving into the scholarly world, who is young, some student, I'm not suggesting that my, my model is the, the road to success. Um, but it certainly worked, worked uh, for me. Um, and I think that one of the, um, the interesting aspects for me now being a CG is that there real, really is an opportunity and an expectation that the work we do here has to be well-informed, serious, intellectual, re intellectually based research. Um, it often will not come with the theoretical trappings that uh, usually come with formal academic work, though I don't think that's entirely out of place because I think theory is so terribly important in helping you ask more interesting and unexpected questions. Yeah, we could either be explicit about it or leave it. That's right. Um, but the challenge of then taking that work and realizing that you are explicitly committed here to identifying targets and then figuring out how are you going to produce deliverables that come out of your research that are the best deliverables for the specific target. Um, we in the academic world usually don't ask that, that question. We presume that um, we have two pr principal vehicles and it's either an academic journal article or it's a book or chapters in a book. Um, and those are peer reviewed and it goes out and it may have a, a thousand, it may have 200, it may have 5,000 readers. Um, and in Canada, 5,000 readers would be a bestseller. It certainly would. Um, when you're at CG, you're thinking in a much more um, instrumental way. We know that we have to uh, have credibility, so the work that we're going to be involved in should be accessible to and respected by the scholarly community. But if it's only that, it's not going to do the job. We have to be able to meet with decision makers. We have to be able to get out beyond our own community. Um, and I mean that also beyond the think tank community because the think tank community is not so large. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also quite competitive. Uh, we have to identify, is it the G20, are the UN decision makers, is it a specialized agency, is it a national uh, government, um, is it, in some cases, it'll be the major non-governmental organizations. You know, you think about food security or refugees. You're not going to be able to address many of the biggest I issues that, that are both here and over the horizon if you only deal with the government or intergovernmental organizations. Increasingly, you have to deal with aspects of civil society. Mm -hmm. A think tank has um, the responsibility, which perhaps a university has not yet recognized, and I think it's an interesting debate whether it should, especially a public university, but a think tank at least has the responsibility to take the work it does 
and decide how does it want to make a difference, what are the, um, the links in that chain, and then how do you develop specific ways of, of, of providing information in an appropriate way that can be absorbed, whether it's the one-page summary or the 25-page paper or the monograph. Right. Well, it's hard to imagine a more important task than that, uh, but a more complex one as well. Thanks for coming in and sharing uh, uh, your pleasure. understanding of CG and your vision of its activity with us. And I hope to have you back again. We'll talk about your own research uh, in more detail fun. at some point. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. And look for us as usual at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with David DeWitt on governance gaps. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario to discuss some issue of uh, global governance or international public policy. Today I'm very happy to welcome the uh, Vice President of Programs here at the Center for International Governance Innovation, Dr. David DeWitt. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. Usually I have a guest and we talk about an issue and the, the governance surrounding it or the lack of governance surrounding right. it. And today we'll start at any rate flipping that around. We'll talk about governance and in particular the issues that are in dire need of it. Uh, Center for International Governance Innovation has a mandate to promote uh, public policy, thinking about uh, global governance issues, right. and uh, you're now in charge of the program operation, the program side of the operation. Right. So uh, just could you step back a little bit and reflect uh, for us on your understanding of CG's particular mandate and, and its niche, because there are many uh, think tanks that are involved in explore, exploring uh, global governance issues. Um, CG's one and not necessarily one of the bigger ones. How do you see CG contributing in a, in a creative way to thinking about global governance gaps? Good questions all, and there are a number of them in there. Um, so let me start with, I think, um, what the, the vision of CG as a think tank uh, is. Um, it, the shortest way of phrasing it, I think, is that uh, the initial intent is to create a Canadian-based uh, think tank that uh, is prepared to address some very tough uh, global uh, issues, issues that are sufficiently um, important, uh, potentially very serious, um, longer term. Uh, they're, they're, they involve over-the-horizon kinds of thinking, but also obviously required uh, a much more regular uh, s set of, of uh, interventions, if you want to use that l language, or actions, um, in areas that uh, no single state or no single act, um, and uh, the results are not um, necessarily all that straightforward. That uh, for a think tank, we would have our standard deliverables. You'd look at uh, the published word, whether that's in a, uh, in today's world, it might be a blog uh, or an online c uh, commentary. Um, it might be the classic uh, uh, journal article or op-ed piece in a major newspaper or indeed a book. Um, but there are also other sides to that. Um, because there's a commitment to bring uh, evidence and analysis to the public domain and particularly to public policy, we have to target uh, uh, our audiences in some way. So while there's, uh, as you're doing here, an interest to try and unpack uh, important issues um, that anyone can have access to. There's also the more selective targeting so that uh, for the work that you're in the international community has a capacity of addressing on its own. That um, embedded within the mandate is the, the assumption and it, it may well true, true, uh, prove in some cases not necessarily always to be, be uh, held that um, most of these issues require some sense of collaboration and cooperation across boundaries, 
uh, across thematic areas, that they're complex, um, and uh, CG is, uh, albeit a small organization, uh, through careful selection of areas in which to concentrate, meant to contribute to that debate. Um, I think it's important to understand that as a think tank, CG sees itself as a place that not only carries on um, research, but is a place that also facilitates bringing together the best and the, the brightest from wherever they, they may be to bring their views to bear 